Okay, Jordan, it's your turn. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me. My talk is, is it the language or the task design reinterpreting language models, successes in morphology and syntax learning. So we know that uh, modern neural language models are good at a lot of things. Uh, they've uh, completely changed certain aspects of our lives. So then a natural question is, well, why is this? Why are they so good at so many things? And this has been investigated in several different areas in several different ways. I'm a linguist, so my focus is on their linguistic capabilities. And uh, this really has twin goals. Well, people have asked questions like, uh, do these models perform well because they thoroughly capture the language in terms of human-like learning or representations or processing? And at the same time, you can ask, well, if they are good models of language, does that imply that these are also good cognitive models? Does this tell us about how humans do language? So for this talk, I'd like to look at how people have approached these questions and uh, some reinterpretations of those results for uh, syntax and morphology, and then I'll draw a conclusion, which is that these modern models may or may not have high linguistic competence, but the current evaluation practices prevent us from actually answering that question. And I'll give some suggestions for what things we can do uh, to improve that. So starting with syntax, and I will explain the duck theme uh, shortly, uh, the general idea in this area is that, well, we know that hierarchical syntactic structure, however you want to represent it, is fundamental to natural language. And we know that modern deep learning models perform well on a wide range of language tasks. So then this raises the question, do these models succeed because they induce hierarchical syntax from unlabeled data? And if so, is that part of why they perform so well? And if they're doing that, this is the question I posed before, are they then good cognitive models of language acquisition and representation? So there's been a significant amount of work on this over the last few years, both on the representations and the acquisition. Uh, you get mixed results, but clearly leaning towards yes. And increasingly over the last few years, there has been standardization in how the evaluations are done. There are more and more benchmarks, especially BLIMP, that's the most popular one that different teams are using. And as of last year, they even came together in a shared task to look at this question. And all of most of these, including all the ones I cited, are using behavioral probing as their primary methodology which is fra framed like this. Does a given system or model behave as though it has syntactic representations? So they're not really looking into the model itself. They're just asking, well, does it behave like it? So if a model can solve a task that we believe can only be solved with syntax, where that we believe is carrying a lot of weight here, well, then the model must have induced some kind of human-like syntax. This is like the duck typing problem. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quack like a duck, then it's a duck. Uh, this is portable, so you don't need to know the model architecture. In some senses, it's cheaper to investigate like this than by probing the internals of the model. But it's a huge assumption that the task can only be solved with human-like strategies. This is paired generally with what I'm calling template-based evaluation, which is where uh, you do the behavioral probe on test sets that are automatically and artificially generated rather than drawn from natural data. This gets around uh, an important part of data sparsity in language. So it turns out by token count, most sentence structures in your language of choice, which is almost always English for this, aren't very informative for this question. So instead, you could just generate a bunch that are informative. The problem here is that if you're artificially generating data with templates, this is not limited to language. You can introduce all kinds of unintended, unintended statistical regularities into your data. And we know uh, that language models are very good at exploiting any kind of statistical regularities that they find. Plus, if you've picked a handful of phenomena you're interested in and your templates lack sufficient variety, there may be a lack of empirical coverage in your tests. So I've worked on two studies over the last two years that approached this question in particular. Uh, the first one is from 2020. Uh, it's a reevaluation of a paper from 
a previous year, which asked, well, can LSTMs distinguish string similar but syntactically different sentence types? The idea being if they're syntactically distinct, but string similar and the model can distinguish them, then it must be capturing the syntax somehow. These are the sentence types that they looked at. These are their examples, except I added the annotations so that you could see the difference between them. And you see they all contain very similar vocabulary, but there are some structural differences here. So comparing the unreduced object relative clause, the first one, the conspiracy that the employee welcomed divided the country compared to, for example, the active subject relative clause, the employee that welcomed the conspiracy searched the building. Uh, you can see uh, the difference between the subject and the object position. So let's give you a moment to look at these. This is the data they used. And uh, the way they invested, investigated this was kind of clever. Uh, they took an analogy from psycholinguistics from syntactic priming. Priming in general is when if you give a human a certain type of input, uh, then they become, then they're primed, they become faster and more efficient at recognizing that same kind of input relative to other types of input. So for syntactic priming, if you give people sentences of one structure, then more sentences of that structure compared to other structures, they'll recognize it faster. That's what they did for the model. They generate, they trained on Wikipedia, then they generated test and adaptation sentences for each of their sentence types using templates and their codes available. They then uh, tested on 20 sentences of each type, so from the test set, and recorded the, the, the scores as negative log probabilities for the sentences. Then they went back and adapted on 20 more sentences of one sentence type, and then reevaluated all the test sentences. So uh, the idea here is if the surprisal or negative log probability improves for the same sentence type that it was adapted on more than for other sentence types, then it has in some sense learned to distinguish one sentence type for another. And according to their reasoning, since you would need hierarchical representations to do this, therefore the model has induced some sort of hierarchical representations. And here are their results. So this is the plots from their paper. Adaptation effect here is the change in negative log probability. And what they're looking for is they want the blue bars to be bigger than the pink bars. They want the adaptation effect on the same type sentences that it was adapted on to be greater than on the different type sentences. They don't tell us how big the bar should be, just that relatively the blue should be bigger than the pink. And that is true and statistically significantly true for every sentence type. So they concluded a positive result. But does this, if we step back a bit, does this really mean that the LSTM has encoded hierarchical syntax? Like, can we conclude that? And my issue here was that they had no baseline to compare to. What would a model that we know doesn't have hierarchical representations do? So we considered two baselines. The first is, well, maybe it's actually still the surface word order driving the results, in which case an n-gram model should do well. And so here are just two examples. So in the unreduced object relative clauses, you get uh, the bigram that the, which you don't get in active uh, subject relative clauses. And then you get, if you have, if you know something about part of speech, you'll see two verbs in a row in the first one, but you won't see two verbs in a row in the second one. So there is a signal there. And the second idea was, well, what if it's not word order, but lexical co-occurrence? So certain words are more likely to appear in certain sentences. In which case, if we were to shuffle the words in the adaptation sentences, we should still see the effect because we're destroying the syntax then. So for example, in the unreduced passive relative clauses, we always see was or were, and we see by, but we don't see those in the active relative clauses. And here's what we got. Just very easily, I trained a four gram model on less data. And what here we're looking for is the blue bars to be greater than the yellow bars. And that was true significantly for most of the tests. 
So this suggests a very weak test. And then for the scrambled adaptation results, this is what just an example of what our adaptation sentences look like. Uh, period, year that the, the last worshipped shy the help CEO's team protest. And once again, mostly worked. The same type is greater than the different type. And actually, if we compare this to the n-gram results, they're complementary. So every every example, every sentence type, uh, we get the effect for one or the other model. And we know LSTMs are pretty powerful and they could be encoding both of this kind of information. So our conclusions for this was that both baselines pass the success criterion in most cases. And this is because uh, the previous authors did not establish a meaningful adaptation effect size. So in other words, their predictions were too vague. And uh, this means that the baseline results could have been reported as successes in the original paper, which is than a nonsense result, because we know n-grams don't represent syntax. This also suggests, but doesn't prove, that superficial word order and lexical co-occurrence drive the success. Since we know that the learning models tend to take the easy way out when side channel information exists, this is a real possibility that would require extra evaluation to rule out, which no one has done. And this uh, reveals the fundamental weakness of the popular template-based behavioral probes. You always need to compare against a simple baseline at least, which is often not done. That was in 2020. Well, what's happened since 2020? I think the biggest thing has been the move towards standardized benchmarks. And so there are several of these grammaticality benchmarks now available for syntax. These allow large scale comparison between systems because everyone can use the same data. So that's good. And researchers don't need to be experts in syntax or whatever other, other linguistic phenomenon they're looking at in order to build their own test sets. That's also good. This is good in principle. And so in this 2023 paper, we looked at two of the most popular benchmarks. The first is BLIMP which made up part of the baby LM challenge that started last year. The way this works is that a sentence is come in pairs, grammatical and ungrammatical pairs, covering 12 linguistic phenomena as they classified them. These were generated with, sent with templates so that the two sentences are minimally distinct lexically. Again, they're not always completely identical. Sometimes they are. And what we do is we have a model, and then we look at the, the model's uh, score for both the grammatical and ungrammatical sentence. If the model assigns higher probability to the grammatical one relative to the ungrammatical one, then we say that the model has succeeded. That's the idea, at least. So this is an adjunct island example from Blimp, where the grammatical sentence is, who should Derek hug after shocking Richard? When the ungrammatical uh, twin is, who should Derek hug Richard after shocking, which is definitely not grammatical. Here, they're lexically identical, just in a different order. Zorro is similar. It has the same setup, but it's explicitly language acquisition focused. It has a restricted vocabulary in order to test language models that were trained on child-directed speech. Uh, and these models, the idea would be they could help us understand language acquisition. This is related released with baby Berta, which is a transformer model that satisfies these constraints. Overall though, as I'll show, we found that it was not just a restricted vocabulary that Zoro added, their sentences are actually simpler. They have simpler templates. So here's a pair from the local attractor in question with auxiliary uh, phenomenon. Is the whale getting the person versus is the whale gets the person? And I think it's clear to any human which one is grammatical. So looking through these, we immediately found some issues, which is first, many of the uh, test pairs are semantically odd in some way or are not actually testing grammaticality. So the blimp authors argued that this is a non-issue since it affects both sentences in the pair, but uh, that may be uh, getting ahead of ourselves here because we also know from studies on humans 
that infelicity, semantic infelicity, affects human judgments of well-formedness and forced choice tasks, which is like the human equivalence to this blimp task. And so here's an example infelicitous sentence from Zorro. I didn't look for this. This was the first sentence pair in the across prepositional phrase phenomenon. The grammatical sentence is the lie on the foot is flat, when the ungrammatical one is the lie on the foot are flat. What these sentences are supposed to be doing is testing for long distance number agreement between the underlined subject noun and the verb. And it took me a while to even figure out what this was supposed to mean. And the hint is that lie here is a noun, not a verb. It's definitely infelicitous. This doesn't make sense. Here's an example from Blimp, which is just invalid. So the grammatical sentence is, the dancer wouldn't aggravate herself, where the ungrammatical one is, the dancer wouldn't aggravate himself. In English, most nouns are not marked for gender. Dancer is no exception. So really, these are both grammatical. Yet there are many examples like this in the data. And so even if the sentence is valid, many of them are actually not testing the intended or any structural pattern. They're testing linear patterns or even just memorization. So picking on anaphora agreement again, the way these templates are set up they only require that the final word in the sentence agrees in number or gender with the first noun, which can be expressed linearly. And uh, the mappings between the name, na names like Sherry and conventional gender is just a memorized fact of English. You just have to know what's a name and what isn't. So this isn't really testing syntax per se. Looking at subject verb agreement, this is actually my favorite. The idea here is that you want to make sure that the verb agrees with the subject noun. So most glasses scare Martin, not most glasses scares Martin. These are meant to test long distance agreement by inserting things like relative clauses and prepositional phrases in the middle, where you have a distractor noun of a different number. So some patients who dislike Kendra negotiate, because negotiate is agreeing with patients, not with Kendra. But actually, two thirds of their sentences have the noun and verb adjacent. So an n-gram model should be able to do this. So reporting good results on subject-verb agreement doesn't really mean that you've got, gotten long distance dependencies. And furthermore, even when there is a distractor phrase, the target noun is always the leftmost or the first noun. So a linear rule like the rightmost verb agrees with the leftmost noun works very well. We implemented that, and that gives us 94% on Zorro and 84% on Blip, which suggests that the opportunity for the shortcut is indeed there. We actually looked uh, more carefully, we wrote Rules like this just to demonstrate that the probes could in principle be shortcutted, not necessarily that these models are doing it or not. You can't answer that question with a behavioral probe, which is another weakness here. And we're able to actually beat baby Berta significantly on both Zorro and Blimp doing this. It's not completely a fair comparison because the rules were hand-built, but I think it gets the point across. Now, these rules were as simple as uh, the second word is the. That just works with the Zorro temp with a lot of the Zorro templates. Or the sentence does not start with a WH word uh, would do well. The most complex ones looked like this, and you can see they're quite a bit more complex. Uh, the, the word following had ends in N, or there's no word ending in N. Or the last word ends in S and Either the first word is many, these, all, most, those, or the second word is lot, or the second word ends in S, I think was the most complicated rule we had. Uh, blimp in general was more challenging than Zorro. We also trained two n-gram models, one over just words and one over part of speech tags on the data. We wanted to keep these very simple. We could have trained something fancier. And we find that actually, one or the other n-gram model 
does well relatively on many of the phenomena, scoring uh, 63 and 58 percent on Zorro and 50 and 38 percent on Blimp. If something like an Engram model can solve a sentence, uh, can solve a phenomenon, then what that means is that that phenomenon is not really relevant for this task. I think it would be much more interesting to remove the phenomena that the Engram model does well on and only evaluate the remainder. That would tell us something more interesting about these models. And so here, well, just to summarize, both the data set and this duck tech text logic are off the mark because much of the data can't actually distinguish linear from hierarchical representations. So we provided a proof of concept for how to do a behavioral probe somewhat better. We used collections of real test sentences developed by syntacticians, extracted from a decade's worth of uh, linguistic inquiry journal articles, that's a theoretical linguistics journal, and the core syntax textbook. Uh, these uh, uh, Sprouse et al. 2013 collected several huge human judgments for each sentence, which then allows comparison across these. These sentences are quite a bit more varied than the uh, ones generated by templates. So this gives us better coverage. Syntacticians who know what they're doing built these. They were created by experts and controlled for semantic implausibility. Uh, we have magnitude estimate judgments rather than this just forced choice binary. And we have multiple judgments per sentence, which allows us to look at correlation between human judgments and between human and model judgments. And I'm gonna skip over these details, but you could ask about them. Uh, here's what we found. So all of our models uh, behave somewhat worse than they did on the templates and they behave worse than people, but they do behave well. Bert and the large Roberta models in particular do quite well, getting almost 90%. However, uh, the models that start with baby, those were the ones that were trained on a small amount of data, perform very similar to the trigram models on the bottom of the plot. So our finding here is that uh, the core current statistics may yield high performance, but how our model judgment behave across structures may reveal a more human-like strategy. Uh, for purposes of time, I'm not going into the details except for one more, which is looking at these correlation matrices. So these are looking at the correlations in ratings between within humans and within and across models. The means are on the left, standard deviations are on the right. The human column is the leftmost column when lighter colors or smaller correlation. What stands out immediately is that the humans are the odd ones out. The, even when the language models achieve good accuracy, they correlate much better with each other than with humans, telling us that there's still something different in some way about the models and the humans. Additionally, I found it interesting that the trigram BNC correlates quite well with many of the models. And remember, trigrams are not uh, linguistically interesting in the relevant sense. And then they correlate very poorly with people. So uh, that's the first part of the talk. These template-based behavioral benchmarks have serious weaknesses because they contain non-hierarchical shortcuts that can be exploited, and their sentences are insufficiently varied and may not be natural. The conclusion here is that unfortunately, these benchmarks are actually not really answering the question that we're interested in. But if we are to use behavioral benchmarks, there are still real and relatively straightforward improvements that we could do to get more interesting and more informative results, such as using this data set that we suggest. So I'm gonna move on to the next part, which is data splitting dimensions of generalization and morphological inflection. So just as a refresher, morphological inflection is patterns of word formation that express grammatical categories. Uh, there's quite a bit of variation across languages in how this is done. 
uh, languages employ all kinds of different approaches. And this poses a learning challenge both for machines and for humans. Within NLP, morphological inflection in recent years has been conceived as the following task. At training time, you're given triples of a lemma, an inflected form, and a feature set. And then at test time, the task is to predict the inflected forms from the lemma and the feature set. So the present third person singular of swim in English is gonna be swims, the plural of box is boxes, the singular of cat is just cat, and so on. People have done this for several reasons. Uh, the first is that it's traditionally taken to be useful in downstream tasks. Uh, people still believe this for low resource languages, many of which happen to be morphologically complex. Like I've said before, this may provide insight into the behavior of the neural network architectures. What kind of generalizations do they make? This may elucidate aspects of linguistic typology. So that's the characterization of how different languages are similar or different from one another. And different performance across languages might identify typological differences. So these are actually related to each other. And it may elucidate aspects of language acquisition. So uh, do these model learners tell us about human learners? And now, there are people who think this task is already solved. There was a series of shared tasks in the late 2010s where these are the top performing systems from the 2018 shared task. And we see on the high training set, so the left column, performance is in the high 90s for every language. Seems like a solved task. However, I was looking closely at the result. So I was looking at pairs of related languages. And so you may be familiar with some of these pairs and triples. Uh, Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic are almost identical. Uh, Azeri and Turkish have a high degree of mutual intelligibility. And yet, especially for the small training size, the performance is very, very different on these, which suggests to me something about the data, right? This is unsurprising in machine learning. If you have different data samples, you might get different performance. But then like, what in particular is going on here is what I wanted to understand. And that has to do with train test overlap. Of course, there are going to be no training triples in the test that appear in the test set. That's bad. Everyone knows not to do that. But remember how the specifics of how this task is organized. Each training triple contains three items. It's possible uh, that the percent of lemmas that overlap or feature sets that overlap between train and test could be driving these results. So in this illustrative example, I have two training items and five test items. Each of the test items represents a different kind of overlap. So in each past, we've seen both the lemma and the feature set, just not together. But in run non-finite, which is supposed to be the infinitive, we've seen the lemma before but we've never seen the feature set. So there are different kinds of test items that we should probably evaluate independently. So does this overlap predict performance? So we can measure lemma overlap and feature set overlap as the percent of test items with lemmas or feature sets attested in train. And here's just Turkish for an example for the different training sizes. I found that it looked like in 2018, le lemma overlap didn't matter much, but feature set overlap did, where the top performing systems were consistently a, a point or two or three below that ceiling, suggesting that maybe there isn't generalization going on across the feature sets. So if this is true, then it's actually how the data was sampled that's driving the performance and not the languages or the models themselves, which would be unfortunate. So uh, this is what we looked at in more detail, controlling for the train test overlaps. So I've looked at this in several directions. Uh, the first is looking at how these uncontrolled data biases lead to, a, lead to inflated and variable performance. Uh, the second is how this affects the linguistic claims that we make. Uh, when I'm not doing this kind of work, I'm really interested in 
algorithmic models of child language acquisition. So uh, we have some models of our own uh, that behave more like children. For the purposes of today, though, I'm just going to focus on these two talks. I have slides for the other ones in the question session, though, for the question session, if you're interested. So the 2023 ACL paper asked, well, how does the train test sampling affect model behavior? Uh, we looked at five languages that we know things about linguistically rather than this large set. We picked Swahili and Turkish because they're highly regular and agglutinative, and I'll explain in a moment why that's important. Our data set came from Unimorph, which is the most popular data set that contains these triples. And we filtered out a bunch of errors that existed in there. We looked at three different types of sampling. Uniform sampling, which is what's traditionally done. You just partition the data into train and test. Weighted is weighting the triples by corpus frequency when doing the sampling. And overlap aware is meant to balance seen and unseen feature sets in the test. A previous work did a single split, but we did five, we split with five random seeds so we can see what kind of variance we get just by different splits. And we looked at uh, four of the systems from what was at the time the most recent iteration of the shared task. I can go into these in more detail later if you want, but I don't think it's really important for uh, my argument here. So to get the idea of what I mean by overlap here, this diagram is meant to be helpful. I don't know if it actually is. So we're particularly interested in test items where the feature set is a tested in train, that's feats attested, versus triples where the feature set is not attested in train, which is features novel. We don't really care about whether the lemma is attested in train or not because we found earlier that that didn't really matter. There was a previous paper. So we want yeah, the gold relative to the red. This is just looking at the distribution in the, in the test data. If we don't control for it, you get mostly feats attested test items for both our small and large training condition. And these are the easier test items. So this would inflate performance. But for overlap aware, we succeed at getting close to a 50-50 split every time. Also notice that the standard deviation when it's uncontrolled is quite high, which means that there's a lot of variance between different random splits as to how much feats attested you get in the test data, which is likely to affect performance in the ways that I already raised. That's not good. And it's also more significant for the small training data than the large training data. Okay, yeah, this is just a summary of what I said. So I'd like to talk about typological expectations before I reveal the results. You can ask whether it's actually fair at all to expect a model to be able to generalize to unseen feature sets. And there are two linguistic dimensions, two typological dimensions at play. The first is paradigm size. Languages with large paradigms, so like a lot of morphological inflection, uh, tend to have really sparse attestation of their different inflective forms. I think there's been a lot of work on this, which means that languages with large paradigms, like even a, even a German-sized noun paradigm, for example, if you, take a if you take a lemma that's not especially frequent, even in millions of tokens of training, you, you might not see every form. And now for languages with small paradigms like English, we do expect everything to be attested. So this is a lot fairer for Swahili and Turkish than it is for English, than it is for German, and it's fairer for German than it is for English. So that, that's that. For agglutinativity, some languages are what we call agglutinative because they have a roughly one-to-one -one mapping uh, between uh, features in their feature sets and morphemes. So you can see this in the Swahili example. And if you have an agglutinative language like this, then generalization should be easy because the overlapping features within the feature sets should clue you in what to do. In some like Spanish, so here's the same word in Spanish, whole feature sets correspond roughly to single morphemes. In this case, generalization across feature sets should be much harder or impossible, but the errors could still be interesting to look at. So here we're getting a 
we have a prediction now. We should do better on languages like Swahili than on languages like Spanish. So high gluten activity, this is fair. High fu highly fusional, no. Uh, we can plot the languages we looked at for this study, where the top right, we should expect the systems to do well. In the bottom left, we should not. And we can see if that's actually borne out. The other way I'd like to think about this as well, could an undergrad do it? If I give a partial paradigm, can you figure out what the rest of it is? So here's a Turkish example. And this is a partial paradigm. I found this in the data uh, for the word guacamole, meaning guacamole. And just looking at this, you should be able to figure out what the two question marks are. And so I'll, we don't have that much time. Here's how we do it. So all the plurals have this layer suffix. Uh, the accusatives end in E. The datives end in A after a consonant or ye after a vowel. And this in then seems to be this PSS 3S. Don't worry about it. Using this, that's enough information to figure out the accusative singular and the data plural. They should be guacamole -y and guacamole lere, like this. An undergrad could do this. So we would hope a model could do it too. Well, here's what we get. So here's for each of the five languages on the small and the large training. The agglutinative languages that should behave the best are highlighted. I give overall results and the results for feats attested, which should be easier than feats novel. And then the delta is how much of a hit you take on feats novel. Importantly, though, we would expect a small, the smallest hit to be on Swahili and Turkish, but that's not what we see. What suggests that the models are not gener generalizing very well across these feature sets. And in I'm not showing it here, but they do generalize well across lemmas. So they are doing something, but not this. And so this reveals something interesting about the model's behavior, which previously went unrecognized. Also, uh, the score ranges are pretty significant, which is a problem across the seeds, which is a problem for the shared tasks, which are competitions. It's possible just to get lucky in the competition if there happens to be a split that works for you. So we, so we suggest to summarize here that uh, systems seem to generalize well to unseen lemmas, but badly to feature sets, which means that the previous results are likely task rather than language dependent, which is not ideal. Poor feature set generalization, we see it even when the task is feasible, like typologically for agglutinative languages, which tells us something new about the language models. Uh, we found that performance is lower as expected on overlap aware. So we suggest using overlap aware sampling in the future. Uh, we can talk about whether the community has taken our advice or not. And then the score ranges are quite high across random seeds which means just one random sample is unlikely to reflect true performance. We also found high variability in performance for overlap aware, which I'll bring that up again. It's actually higher at five points than the other data splits. And this was odd to us. We think it's because it matters which feature sets happen to be the ones in train versus test. And that motivated our follow-up paper. So for the follow-up, this is the last paper I'm going to talk about. Instead of just splitting completely at random into train and test, we designed our splits such that specific pieces of the paradigm were withheld to appear in test. This gives us much more control over what it is, what's being tested than in just random independent splitting. Uh, we can focus the test on aspects of a language's morphology that we believe as linguists would be particularly informative. And I'll go through what we did and what kinds of things we found taking this approach. We, we looked at only three languages this time. Uh, this was much more like data and domain knowledge intensive. We picked English, Spanish, and Swahili. We had a second question, a sort of a side question here, which is all the prior work was done on orthography, 
but we know that some languages have orthography that diverges significantly from uh, the, the phonology. So we made parallel orthographic and transcribed versions of our data just to see if that would do anything. Uh, the basic format was set up pretty similarly to the previous ones. We went with five random seeds again, since we found that to be important previously. And then for the orthography versus transcriptions, we did uh, a dictionary lookup for English. English orthography is uh, famously uh, complicated. And we used a package to do it for Spanish and Swahili. We used three of the same models from before. Uh, the bottom one we used because it was touted as particularly as a cognitively plausible model. And then I'll talk about the different kinds of splits we did. The blind splits are like the previous paper, which are language independent random sampling. I don't care uh, what the identity of the feature sets is. I'm just going to uh, partition them. We only looked at verbs, and we looked at English because it's highly fusional. Swahili because it's highly agglutinative, and Spanish is in the middle. It has some fusional parts of its paradigm and some agglutinative ones. Then our probes are the random sampling that was designed to test specific morphological patterns. And I'll explain in more detail how this was accomplished. Now, there are three types of patterns. Agglutinative feature generalization probes. These are ones that models should be good at. And we have ones for both Spanish and Swahili. All, all the way on the right are fusional generalization probes. These are ones that models, we expect models to fail here, but hopefully they fail in interesting ways that might provide some information about how they work. And then in the middle, instead of looking at just uh, features, we looked at conjugational classes. So Spanish has, Spanish verbs are partitioned into three conjugational classes. They just have different sets of suffixes that they use, or partially different sets of suffixes. And we were curious how the models handle that. Uh, to explain how the probe splits were made, we can look at the Spanish future probe. Within the data set, uh, there are seven parts of the paradigm. And these are all, these are all agglutinative. But they're formed by taking the verbs infinitive and then adding one of the following suffixes. So for each of our five random seeds, we would uh, randomly withhold five of the seven person number combination with indicative future for test. Then we would uh, sample train on the rest of the data like we have been doing. And then we sample test like we have been doing. And then we discard everything that doesn't contain one of the withheld uh, feature sets. So that would give us just testing the Spanish future in particular. Can you generalize to the other five forms from the two that are in training would be the task. Overall, just quickly with the presentation style, we found that it actually has very little effect, which is kind of nice because this means that you can get away with using orthography rather than transcriptions. The effect's even pretty small for English, which was Nice, but also surprising, considering how much English orthography can diverge from the phonology. And we can discuss why we think this wasn't greater. And I'll unveil the results now. So here's how you read these. Uh, the three major columns are the languages, English, Spanish, and Swahili, where the three minor columns which within each of these are the three models where the one on the right, that encoder decoder one, is one that's meant to be cognitively plausible. Uh, the two rows are for orthography versus transcription. And you'll see they end up looking very similar. And then we're reporting percent accuracy. The black dots are the blind probe, so the ones similar to the other paper. And then you see multiple dots because those are the five different seats. Uh, we find the largest score range for English orthography and the smallest for Swahili transcription. And then uh, these were our other probes. 
Just on visual inspection, you can see that orthography and transcription are not identical, but they are quite similar. It's the same general patterns across probes and models. We found that uh, the character transformer model behaved particularly well on the Swahili probes, which is encouraging because it suggests that it, it must actually be doing some kind of feature generalization after all. When the Kluge model, which is the character transducer, sometimes performs well, but shows extremely high variability. So it really matters for that model exactly what is in the training versus test set. We see that the encoder-decoder model is absolutely terrible. Uh, it can't generalize across feature sets at all. The, and at first we thought this was an error, but actually you can see it, it does something on the Spanish conjugation probes. So the ones that two that aren't about feature sets per se. So it is doing something. The model is working as intended. It just doesn't work very well. And now the English probes were all impossible. They're all highly fusional. Like if you've never seen in past, English past in your training data, how would you know what to produce when it's in your test data? So one of the first things we found is that none of the models output the bare lemma. So a lot of, a lot of forms in English are just the bare lemma. The infinitive is the bare lemma. The present is the bare lemma. And we know that young children like to output the bare lemma early in their morphological development, but none of the systems did that. Instead, they added one of the common endings, ing, ed, or es. We had a probe where we tested some of the design decisions of Unimorph. Uh, they marked the bare, the bare forms, the present and the infinitive with nfin rather than prs for present. So we, we wondered if that was affecting generalization. We replaced all the nfins with present, and then this caused the models to output other present forms, the ing and es, which is good, because it means actually they are showing some kind of generalization ability for the present. Of course, that gets marked wrong because they were supposed to output the bare lemma, but they failed in a good way. It would be a way to describe this. So our main conclusions here, and I'm just wrapping up, is that uh, to our surprise, but we were happy about this, orthography and transcription makes very little difference for these three languages. It made the most difference for English, which we could have guessed, but only about four points. We confirmed that score ranges are quite high across random seats, which confirmed our intuition about the high score ranges from overlap aware in the previous study. But this also means that performance on one sample is unlikely to reflect your performance. Uh, time and uh, compute power notwithstanding, you should test on with multiple samples. And these language-specific probes turned out to be quite useful. We were able to draw conclusions that we weren't able to draw on the language independent random probes. So this could be also a way forward to extracting more information about how and why these models do what they do. So in the real overall conclusion, we know that models are really good at a lot of things. I'm not trying to say they aren't useful, but part of our question scientifically is how good are they? And I don't really know. Certain tasks, they're very good. Certain tasks, they don't seem to be. They don't seem particularly good at, at these grammar problems that people have been testing them in the ways I described. So my overall conclusion is that the current evaluation methodologies are not actually equipped to answer these questions, but we have paths forward. And I think I flipped the colors here. And yes, that's what I've been working on in this domain. There are a lot of people to think lots of co-authors on various papers. And also thank you for inviting me. All right.